Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So um, we're waiting for uh, Novi's report and their group. We're going to have um, another report muna on inter enterprise study. So I'll just play this one. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. By the way, this is the group five. So this afternoon, we are going to report about an enterprise study. So before I will go on with the topic, let me first introduce to you my team. By the way, I am Deline Otad and I am the first reporter. Together with me, Janeline Pomperos, Jacqueline Martizano, Novi Gracie Badilia, and Helen Dawa. So the title of the enterprise study that we're going to report is The Major Challenges Facing Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises in Asia and solutions for mitigating them. So this enterprise study was actually produced by the Asian Development Bank Institute and the writers are Nayuki Yoshino and Farhad Tag Tagizade Hezari. Okay, so here's the abstract. So obvious abstract emphasizes the main topic, the focus, and the goal of the study. So the main topic of the study was actually about the small and medium size had Tagizade Hezari. The way I am Deline Otad and I am the first reporter. Together with me, Janeline Pomperos, Jacqueline Martizano, Novi Gracie Badilia, and Helen Dawa. So the title of the enterprise study that we're going to report is The Major Challenges Facing Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises in Asia and Solutions for Mitigating Them. So this enterprise study was actually produced by the Asian Development Bank Institute and the writers are Nayuki Yoshino and Farhad Tag Tagizade Hezari. Okay, so here's the abstract. So obviously, the abstract emphasizes the main topic, the focus, and the goal of the study. So the main topic of the study was actually about the small and medium-sized enterprises or SMEs in Asia. So the scope in the study is not just about in a specific country, but in the whole Asia. So the focus of this study it was about the four major challenges that slowed down the growth of SMAs, which are the lack of finance, the lack of comprehensive databases, the low level of R&D expenditures, and the insufficient use of information technology. And the goal is to provide remedies for these four major challenges faced by the SMAs. So before I will go on, with the introduction of this report, of this study, I'm going to share first the basic insights about small and medium-sized enterprises. So SMAs are actually the non-subsidiary independent firms which employ fewer than a given number of employees. And the most frequent upper limit employees designates in this um, enterprise enterprises is 250 employees so basically we can distinguish small medium and large enterprises through the employment size so in this case the mid the employment size of SMAs is 250 so it could be that the large enterprises is more than 250 employees okay so the sum some of the examples of SMAs are manufacturing, wholesale trade, retail trade, and some more. Talking about the importance of SMA worldwide, it actually accounts for the majority of business worldwide and important contributors to job creation and global economic development. So here in our country, in the Philippines, SMAs are also the ways for us to reduce poverty by creating jobs out of these enterprises. And it even actually 
to contribute also to the gross domestic product in our country. So here's now the introduction. So Asia has been continuously growing, which has elevated poverty and increased the middle income countries in the region. However, the regional and global economic slowdown requires a new growth model for Asia, which strengthened dynamics for small and medium-sized enterprises to boost national productivity. So SMS, SMAs are the backbone of the economies of Asia. So why does SMAs consider as the backbone of the economies of Asia? So SMA is considered as the backbone because it has comprises of most of the enterprises in Asia that creates employments. So for the year of 2007 until 2012, it actually comprises of 98% of enterprises and 66% of the national labor. It also contributed 38% of the gross domestic product. Next is SMA's influence in trade. SMA's growth about 30% of the total export value in Asia on average in 2007 until 2012. In the People's Republic of China or PRC, SMA's accounted for 41.5% of total export value in 2012, up 6.8% year on year. While in Thailand, they made up 28.8% of total export value with 3.7% year-on-year growth. With this, SMAs that are part of the global supply chain have the potential to promote international trade and mobilize domestic demand. So in talking about the definitions of SMAs, so it is actually different country by country. So in some countries, the criteria for the categorization is through capital. In some countries, it is based on the number of employees. And other countries use a mixed criteria like Japan. So here is now the table showing the definitions of SMAs in Japan. So as we can see, they both used stated capital and number of employees in defining the SMAs compared to other countries that only used capital or number of employees only. Some of the reasons behind the slow growth of SMAs are limited access to finance, lack of databases, low research and development expenditures, undeveloped sales channels, and low level of financial inclusion. So in this paper, the focus was on the four major reasons, which are the lack of finance, lack of comprehensive databases, low level of R&D expenditures, and the insufficient use of information technology in SMAs. And this paper will try to provide the remedies for mitigating these four major challenges. So overall, as we can observe, the introduction here emphasizes or shows the background of SMAs in Asia, especially to its great con contributions in strengthening the economy. And this would be an enough reasons for for the researcher for conducting this study towards the four major reasons that slowed the growth of SMAs because if this would not be addressed and cannot customize a possible solutions, then it would lead to poor economy and poverty. So let's talk about now about the importance of SMAs in Asia. So as for the importance of SMAs in Asia, the 14 economies from the 5 ADB regions actually comprises of 90% of total enterprises in each country. So this survey was conducted by, by the Asian Development Bank in 2014. So the 14 economies that I've mentioned here are 
specifically they are the Kazakhstan in Central Asia, the People's Republic of China and the Republic of Korea in East Asia, Bangladesh, India and Sri Lanka in South South Asia, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam in Southeast Asia, and Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. Okay, so here in figure one, we can we can see here the small and medium-sized enterprises' contribution to gross domestic product. So small and medium-sized enterprises, including micro-enterprises, contributed 59.1% of nominal gross domestic product or JDP in Indonesia in 2012 as can be seen in the graph or in the figure and this emphasizes that the figure that is gradually increasing SMAs and micro enterprises in Thailand contributed 37 37% 37 of nominal JDP during 2012 and in Malaysia 32.7% of real JDP in the same year Thailand targeted an, an increase of SMA contribution to JDP of 40% or more in its country strategy 2012. And in Kazakhstan, the, nomi the nominal JDP of SMA tended to increase, but their contribution to JDP decreased over 2010 until 2012 and was 17.3% in 2012 as can be seen in the figure. So next is the figure 2 which shows the employment by small and medium-sized enterprises. So as can be seen in the figure, the extent of employment by SMAs varies by country. The share of SMA employment employees to total employment range between 28% in Kazakhstan and 97.2% in Indonesia in 2012. So with this, it can be concluded that SMAs has a lot of importance in Asia. It is really vital for Asian economic success and it is important that they have fully functioning support measures for SMAs. So let's talk about now the challenges SMAs face. So SMAs face challenges from, say the first one challenge is the increased competition. So in this case, basically it primarily leads to the decreased market share and also shrinks the customer base. So the next one is the ability to rapidly changing market demand. So in this situation, the most affected is the pricing strategy. So in, with this, to surpass this kind of um, situation, the enterprise must look for the customer's needs. So the third one is the technological change. So this one leads to high marketing standard and increased customers' expectations that the enterprise must have to meet. So the fourth one and, and the last is the capacity constraints relating to knowledge, innovation, and creativity. So this one actually can be caused by equipment, labor availability, labor productivity, material shortages, or lack of available space. So in this case, I mean to control this situation, the enterprise must focus on the variables. So let's talk about now the factors for not realizing the potentials of SMAs. So the first factor is the lack of resources. So some of the examples of resources that usually SMAs lacks are finance, technology, skilled labor, market access, and market information. The second factor is the lack of economies of scale and scope. So when we say economies of scale, this occurs when a business benefits from the size of its operation. 
which means as company grows, its unit cost decreases. And when we say economies of scope, this increase the number of goods produced that can decrease the average cost of production. But sadly, some of SMEs lack of economies of scale and scope. The third factor is the higher transaction cost relative to enterprise, which means some of the SMA suffers from having high expenses in different transactions that even relative to the expenses of a large enterprise. So this diminish the returns of the enterprise. And the fourth factor is the lack of networks. So this lack, lack of networks can contribute to lack of information, know-how, and experience of domestic and international markets. The fifth factor is increased market competition and concentration from large multinational enterprises, which is caused by globalization and economic integration. The next factor is the inability to compete against larger firms in terms of R&D expenditure and innovation. So this is because the capacity of small and medium-sized enterprises, enterprises or SMAs is limited compared to larger firms that has the enough knowledge or skills in terms of innovation of product, process, and organization. The next is the subject to churning and instability. So when we say churning, it is an illegal and unethical practi practice by a broker of excessively trading assets in a client account in order to generate commissions. And the last but not the least, the lack of entrepreneurial zeal, capacity, and know-how. So when we say entrepreneurial zeal, capacity, and know-how, it is the mindset that embraces critical questioning, innovation, service, and continuous improvement. So I guess that was all for my report and the continuation for the challenges of SMA's face will be discussed by the next reporter. Once again, this is Dylan Otted and good afternoon. So this time, I will explain the four major challenges faced by the small and medium-sized enterprises. So first is the difficulties in assessing finance. Second is lack of information infrastructure for SME. Third is low level of business R&D in the SME business sector. Then the last is insufficient use of information technology. So first, so we discuss the SME's difficulties in assessing finance. So as we see in the figure three, or the diagram so it shows that the thick line shows the difficulties faced by the small and medium-sized enterprises and the thin line it shows the relative ease for the large enterprises so if they have a uh, zero data points so it indicates that the companies are finding it difficult to raise money from either banks or the capital market so as we see in the figure so sme have more difficulties in assessing finance compared to large enterprises or they have uh, encounter more difficult situation in raising money it compared to the large firm so, when it comes in banking or the banks prefer, so many banks prefer to allocate their resources to large enterprises. So, rather than to the small and medium-sized enterprises, it is because the reason is that large enterprises have a lower risk of default. And their financial statements are clear. However, to the small and medium-sized enterprises, so they are a riskier than the large enterprises it is because their their accounting information so they they do not have a clear financial statement next is the lack of information infrastructure for sme 
in which the supplier and the demanders of fund of the SME will encounter an asymmetric information problem. So, like the lack of infrastructure of communication and or the network services. So, it leads to the SME to difficult to handle their business. However, most SME have no connection with capital market. It's because their business is unlike the large firm or large enterprises. The financial institution, it can closely and continuously observe borrowers, but they notice that it is costly to do for borrowers of small loans. So the lack of information infrastructure for SME exacerbates the information asymmetry prob problem or the, it will lead to reduce their productivity. Moreover, the SME is based in collateral in which the provision of collateral is the simplest way for SME and the financial institutions to reduce the risk premium in loan formulations. So the SME or the lack of infrastructure of SME, so it is because of their business that is not enough to, to make a, a good infrastructure for their type of any business. Then the third is the low level of business R&D in SME sector in which business enterprise expenditure on research and development is an important driver of innovation and economic growth in which R&D of SME sector so they cannot they cannot afford the said research and development of any type of, of knowledges it is because R&D is very expensive or very costly in which they do not have enough money to research for new knowledge and that knowledge it will translate into new product or the new processes though in some economies small and medium sized firms account for significant share of the total business R&D effort this may due to a relatively large body of SME to that perform a large amount of research and development. If the share of SME in total business enterprise expenditure on research and development in some Asian economy is very low, like Japan with only 5%. So this is one of the important reasons behind the slowed economic growth, the low level of business. However, when we look at economies in many non-Asian developed economies, this ratio is result more than a two-thirds, like the country of New Zealand and Estonia. Then the last is the insufficient use of information technology and SME. So, information technology has developed rapidly. Household ownership of mobile phones, smartphones, and tablet computers has also spread quickly in the recent years. But the SME or the small and medium-sized enterprises have been unable to sufficiently utilize, utilize such opportunities since most small enterprises do not have their own website. So that is the main problem of the SME. So they do not have a website to, to make their product uh, easily, easily uh, market via online. Though, though technology has a big help in uh, any type of businesses. So, when it comes to the SME, so they cannot adapt those type of technology. Like for instance, in Japan, so household mobile phone ownership reached beyond 90% and internet users reached 90.58% of the population in 2014. 
Do SME selling product and receiving orders via their own website accounted for only 10% of the total and less than 10% have their own online shops or market their goods on internet shopping site? So that is uh, the insufficient use of information technology in small and medium-sized enterprises. So that's all. So next reporter. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, classmates. Once again, I'm Janeline A. Pantera, reporter. Today, let's talk about the remedies for tackling SME development challenges. The previous section defines the major challenges that face SMEs. In this section, we provide some efficient remedies for the development of SMEs in Asia. This solution have worked in some Asian economies and it is necessary to expand them to the rest of Asia. First, Diversifying Channels of Financing In this section, we describe three different methods for easing SME financing by developing credit guarantee schemes by governments, developing private SME lenders, and developing hometown investment trust fund for financing risky SMEs and startup businesses. So let's talk about first the development of credit guarantee schemes. Owing to the significance of SMEs to Asian national economies, it is important to find ways to provide them with a stable finance. However, SMEs usually have severe difficulties pricing money. The undersupply of credit to SMEs is mainly because of the asymmetric information, high default price, and lack of collateral. SMEs have more difficulties accessing finance compared to large enterprises. Then the institutions mainly prefer to increase the flow of funds to the latter sector. Since the aforementioned reasons are lower in this group, in order to fulfill this problem, various government and donor initiatives have emerged and develop, develop as well as developing and emerging economies and created the Credit Guarantee Schemes or CGS, the Public Credit Guarantee Scheme, it is a tool to reduce the supply-demand gap in SME finance. The purpose for the creation of such schemes is to contribute the, to the flow of funds in the sectors that have difficulties raising funds, that is the SME sector. The CJS makes lending more attractive by absorbing or sharing the risk associated with lending to, to the targeted sector. This scheme can also increase the amount of loan funds available to an enterprise beyond its own collateral limits because the guarantee is a form of loan collateral. A CG is consists of a three parties, a borrower, a lender, and a guarantor. The borrower is often an SME or a micro-enterprise seeking deep capital. This borrower typically approaches a private financial institution or bank for a business loan. For reasons of asymmetry of information, the loan request is frequently toned down by the private lender. This is where the guarantor comes into the picture. The guarantor, usually a government of trade associations, seeks to facilitate access to deep 
capital by providing lenders with the comfort of a guarantee for a substantial portion of the deed. In the figure number 4, this is an example of credit guarantee schemes of Japan. CGC's money comes from the national government or from the Ministry of Finance to the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, and also from local governments. The national governments provide direct subsidies to CGC's, provide subsidies for compensation assist to the Japan Federation of Credit Guarantees Corporation or GFG, and GFG provides it as compensation in case loss of losses to, to the CGC's. Also, the national governments provide funds for credit insurance to the Japan Finance Corporation or GFC, and GFC uses these funds to insure the contracts. On the other hand, local governments are also supporters of CGCs that provides contributions and loans to them. Credit guarantee schemes makes banks lending to SMEs easy because in case of SME default, the credit guarantee cooperation with each, which is a government organization, will cover a certain percentage of the lender's losses. In Asia, Credit, uh, credit guarantee schemes have been widely established in India, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Korea, Malaysia, and Papua New Guinea, and in the Philippines has two credit guarantee programs for MSMEs. The partial guarantee scheme provided by the Small Business Corporation and the Credit Surety Fund program under the Central Bank. Next is the development of the specialized private banks for SME financing. In Japan, there is a good example of the development of specialized private banks for SME financing. It is called Shinkin Banks. Shinkin Banks are deposit-taking cooperative banks that specialize in financing SMEs within a region. Just like city banks and regional banks, Shinking banks are protected by deposit insurance and are subject to the capital advocacy requirements and other banking regulation and supervision. Unlike city banks or regional banks, however, Shinking banks make loans mainly to the members of SMEs who capitalize the Shinking banks. They can make loans to the non-member of SMEs but they have to restrict the share of the loans to non-members of SMEs to below 20%. On the other hand, they can accept deposit from anyone. And the uh, next is the development of hometown investment trust funds for risky SMEs. Given that the financial system in Asia are dominated by banks, the creation of regional funds or hometown investment trust fund to promote the lending to start-up companies and risk-care borrowers such as SMEs would help maintain the soundness of the banking sectors as banks would not expose to the risk that lending too much companies which is posed in figure number 5, bank-based small and medium-sized enterprise financing and hometown investment financing to risk care borrowers. Sealing those regional trust funds through branch offices of regional banks, post offices, credit associations, and large banks would increase the funding sources for regional companies. Such trust funds would not be guaranteed by a deposit insurance corporation and the associated risk would be borne by investors. The terms of a trust fund would have to be explained to investors such as where their, where their funds would be invested and what would be risk, what the risk would be. In order to strain potential investors, confidence and help expand the trust fund market. Example of such funds in the Japan include wind power generators and musicians funds. In the in the example, to construct 20 main power generators, public-private partnership where lands and local residents invest $1,000 to $5,000 in a fund. 
They receive dividends every year to the sales of electricity by each wind power generator in which they had invested. Musicians, funds, gather many small investment to buy units for $150 to $500. If the musicians become successful and their music sells well, the sales will generate a high rate of return for the fund. A hometown investment trust fund has three main advantages.